I want to share with you attribution theory. This is a social communication theory. And what it, what it tells us is that when we're in a conflict, in a relationship with someone and there's conflict, part of this communication, not just a specific word or sentence, but our, our general way of interacting with them, we try to make sense of people's behavior. We try to understand, why did they do that to me, right? If someone does something that you don't like, most people will, also, will then try to think, why did they do that to me? Okay, so what is the meaning that we put on that? And that meaning is, depends on, like we said, several things. My self-perception, my perception of that person, our history of interaction, okay? If I do, what I do to one person who's a friend of mine, if I do that to someone else, it can be taken in totally different ways. So if I do something good to someone, um, for example, if I, Bong, I'm always picking on you because you're right here. I hope you don't mind. But <clears throat> if I were to um, give you a ride home after class, then I would, the, if someone said, why did you do that? I'd say, well, you know, because I'm a nice person, right? So it's about who I am, okay? So where someone, if you might, your interpretation of that might be, well, you gave me a ride home because it's right along the way and you're a nice person. Okay. But, so, that's, that's the, the cause of, um, right? So you interpret m the cause of my action to be external because there is, it was on the way home. Whereas for myself, I say I'm a nice person. Oftentimes, if I do something wrong to him, say I just, you asked me for a ride home and I said, I can't do that. And I would say, why? Well, because I'm busy or I, you know, I really, I don't have time to do it. So the reason for that is not because I'm a bad person, but because there's some other circumstance that's making me do it. However, his interpretation might be, wow, he's kind of mean. Right? So we assume that the cause of the negative action is actually caused by something internal. So we judge them sort of internally, unless we get other information, unless we have a good relationship to discover that. So we attribute we attribute to their actions that are bad some sort of internal, psychological, maybe a character flaw, or they're really just a bad person. Whereas we internal all, we, we attribute or we associate our own sort of uh, wrongdoing or things we don't do correctly, we, we would say that they are caused by external forces. So it's a long way of saying we give ourselves the benefit of the doubt, but we tend not to give other people the benefit of the doubt. So, when, so that becomes very important when we're involved in conflict, because it's easy to then make a judgment against another person, because we would assume it's just something about the way our brains work. No? So that's why we want to sort of we have to do some reprogramming and shifting in how we actually open up our communication patterns and our thinking that goes behind our communication pattern. So, if I attribute some, he did something bad to me and I say, it's because he's a bad person, not because someone made him do it. He's a bad person and I blame him, then it's his fault, right? And then I say, because he's a bad person, you can't change a person. That's just his character. So then when I think about my next move with him, I'll say, he's just a bad person. And so it's likely that I will escalate. If it's a conflict, it becomes easy to escalate. 
Whereas if we are friends, and I know if he does something wrong, but I know there's other factors, I'll say, no, it's okay. I, you know what? It's okay. I understand why this happened. It was because there were other issues. He had a, you know, whatever. And so then I can say, uh, I can de-escalate my assumption, and then I won't blame. I won't cast fault on the other person. So that's why, like we said before, caring about what other people say, we have to be very careful to listen so we know. We need to be, remain curious and have presence, partnership, focus, and intention. Okay, means we need to be present with the person. See this as a partnership. So there's two people. To make this loop work out as best as possible, it has to be a communication partnership. And we have to have good intentions to, for that all to happen. <clears throat> so this process, remember we said in the, the process between like hearing something and what happens in the brain of how we interpret things, we make, in, what is an inference? An inference is a decision about information that you get. So it's like a, a series of steps that we don't, that happen instantaneously in our mind, but we never actually break it down. So if we see something happening, say we see a conflict between two people, and I saw um, Helen, you know, nudge Lang's nudge Leng, and then I'll say, okay, I just saw this happen. What I didn't notice was that she was smiling, or maybe I just decided, because I'm mad at Helen, that the expression on her face. So somehow, so we, we choose which data to notice, right? And then we interpret that. Was that was that nudge a friendly nudge? I was it like, or it was like, be quiet? Or was it like, hurry up? What was behind that? So we make, we interpret that and then we make an assumption. Helen must be mad at Leng, okay? So I draw a conclusion, that's why she did that. And then I adopt my belief. Helen is really upset and angry today about something. And then I might take action. Now, it could be a bad action or it could be a good action. I say, Helen, what's bothering you? I noticed you nudged her. You seem really angry. And she says, oh, no, no. I was just trying to tell her to remind her about something that we discussed the other day. So we have to step back down this ladder or we have to, con we have to validate what our observations are. And everyone will select different data. They will interpret things differently and draw conclusions, and then believe and take actions. So for us, for, for us, we have to have this self-reflection in order to bring that into the communication. We need to ask people, well, what did you see happen? Because they might say, well, I saw this and this. And you say, oh, you didn't see that? They say, no, I didn't see that. Or, or, and you say, but it was right in front of your eyes. How could you miss it? It was so obvious. You know? Like, have you ever had that conversation? Like, how did he not see that? Everyone saw that. He, he looked, you know, that dirty look, like, hey, it was so obvious. And then someone will say, no, I didn't even notice that. Or maybe I just thought he was, you know, it was time to get coffee or I don't know. So, so we have to be able to assert and advocate carefully and say, how, what is actually happening in this so that we can separate these things out and understand that we, from when something happens in the world and from when someone takes action, there's a lot of points where things can be clarified and things can be understood. Okay, so listening. This is all sort of our working up to listening. Empowerment comes through presence, just being present with someone, okay? Learning to empower others is not a matter of learning the right answers, but rather being with them together. 
If we try to solve people's problems, as my wife always tells me, stop trying to solve my problems, just listen to me. You know, I don't need you to tell me what to do. Um, <laughs> Helen's smiling at me. Um, so guys, that's, I don't know if that's our typical problem of men. So, but it's true in, in any relationship, in any communication. If we try to jump to the problem solving, there will be resistance. Don't try to solve my problem, I can solve my own problem. I mean, that's, they may not say that to you, but that can be the internal dialogue. Why are you getting involved in my business? It's not your business. So when we have this active listening, when we have authentic concern for the person, concern for understanding that what I perceive to have happened may not be what happened. It might be interpreted differently. People notice different things. I didn't notice that. So when we have that active listening, that authentic, then we can have this kind of a deep dialogue. And that's what we want to do. If we're going to get past this, just the, the surface stuff that, that we so often, um, we, we call that communication, but it's not really um, active listening. Okay. So one of the things we can do is to help us in our communication is called reframing. Who's done reframing before? Anyone done reframing? So maybe your boss or the, the supervisor comes in here. You know, the big problem in this team, this work group is you don't have your lack of initiative. You're not taking enough initiative. Wow, suck it. How could, we, how could someone, how could we say that in a way that would not be offensive? Okay, that's reframing. We could say, well, what could we do differently that we haven't thought about today? So we want to flip that into a positive, a positive way of getting at this. Maybe it's a concern we have that people don't seem to be working hard enough or there's sort of this, you know. You, so we can ask a question. Instead of saying, the biggest problem is, when we jump to that problem solving, then you already, once you, then you already are making a, a judgment. You can ask the question, what can we do differently here? It seems that things aren't going the right way. Maybe there's something we haven't thought about. Okay, how can we reframe this? Why did I have to be born into such a troubled, pro okay, a troubled family? We are so messed up. My dad's an alcoholic. My mom is always working. How can we reframe this? How could we ask a question that would change, shift this perspective. So let, we, we kind of shift that around. What, does our, what could we look like when we're at our best? Okay. So instead of think, focusing, see these are all problem, actually these are problem statements or problem question, this was a question. So how do we shift that in, from problem to possibility? This is, I can, can I put in my brief commentary here, political commentary? This is why the war on drugs to be is so misguided, because it's primarily a problem-oriented approach. And we're not saying, what can we do differently? How can we empower communities? Okay, that's, that's, okay. <laughs> now stepping back, okay, here we go. How can we reframe things? The point being, whether it's individual, social, we can actually reframe our approaches so that we think about what's the potential here? If we go from problem solving, if we focus on problems, then um, yeah, let's, keep, let's keep going down here. 
Why do our leaders always mess up? We say, what could we and our leaders do to, so that we can win together? And why do we still have these problems? How could we be creative in planning for a better future? So shifting from a problem focus approach to a possibility approach. If we focus on problems, then ultimately, one, it drains energy. And it, it, it ends up, even good, well-intention, you miss out on the positive, the, the social assets or the strengths that exist, whether it's in an individual or a community or an organization. And ultimately, it's disempowering. When we focus on po potential and possibility, then we're saying, look, there's creativity here. Everyone has a role in it. And it actually means we can share power. The more we share power for what's working well, then the more there is for everyone. <laughs>